So like human intervention, especially if it looks or feels industrial, seems to be a good clue that that I'm going to have to do some testing. Yes, it's better to be safe than sorry. And also, yeah. it's a, if for heavy metals, it's more like a one-time investment. Heavy metals don't move much. So unless you change your landscape, you add new soil, you mix something in, it's not going. They're not going to change. So if you test them once, mm. uh, that's a, like it's enough. Then if you want to remediate it, you test it over time to see if remediation worked. But this, this mm -hmm. is not like pH. It's not uh, nutrients that change seasonally. So heavy metals, it's uh, really more more or less one time it's, it's more static yeah. yeah if you have been wondering what is in your soil you are not alone that is something that both Jacques and myself and everyone else on the Epic Gardening team are wondering 24 seven. In fact, one of the first things that Jacques ever did when he first started working at Epic Gardening is run a soil test on the soil here at the Epic Homestead. Well, this week we have Dr. Anna Paltseva on the podcast. She's an endowed assistant professor and an international urban soil scientist at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. So we haven't had someone with your credentials on the show yet. Anna, I'm really excited to get into this. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk to your audience and share what I know. We talk about testing soil here on the podcast every so often, but typically we talk about it more for soil texture, soil quality, as well as nutrient density. But there's obviously other things that you could test soil for, right? Yes, absolutely. Uh, this is a great start to start with the soil texture. I think it's a home address. Everyone needs to know soil texture. But uh, soil health, um, it also encompasses um, organic matter and um, bacteria. So for those who have resources to test their microbial composition, it would be great. But there are some uh, kits these days for home gardeners they can use, like microbiometer, for example. It's an easy test that people can uh, do at home and see. Uh, bacteria to fungi ratio and um, carbon uh, or like biomass activity, I think that's what it is. Or just making observations about your soil and how many microorganisms, uh, uh, well, microorganisms you can only see under microscopes unless you have that. But you can see worms, you can see bugs, you can see um, activity in your soil, you can see how dark it is. It will already suggest about soil health. Or just smelling it. It's uh, Our noses are also a really great way to test your soil without even touching it. If it's earthy, if it smells sweet, very pleasant, like forest or something that you want to smell more, it's a good. It means that they have organisms called actinomycetes in them. And this is very healthy population to have in your yard. If you find it's uh, smell is sour or metallic, very unpleasant, and there's something to be aware of, and most likely it lacks oxygen. So you need to irate your soil. Uh, maybe till it a little bit or kind of um, do some kind of disturbance to bring air in. So those are important things to consider when you talk about soil health um, in your yard without um, expensive lab tests. Yeah, the the question I I had for you was, you know, a lot of the people listening, they're home gardeners and just passionate home gardeners, maybe even getting into their first home or their first property and something that I didn't quite do a couple of years back when I purchased my property was anything beyond some of the tests that you mentioned, the smell, you know, grabbing some, feeling the texture of it, digging down a little bit, but I didn't run any lab tests. Do you think that's important to do for, you know, maybe a family with kids moving into their first home? Yes, absolutely. I had a lot of uh, clients who sent samples to our lab here in Louisiana. I previously worked at Brooklyn College. Specifically, parents were requesting to test the soil before they would buy a house uh, because they wanted to know, especially if they're in urban environments like New York City or New Orleans, Chicago, Detroit, Los Angeles, Atlanta, big cities may have uh, contaminated soils. And it's super important for parents to be aware of it and send a, a sample to a local lab or many, and there are so many labs they can send their, uh, like half a cup of the soil and see what potential toxins they may find. Even if they start with just heavy metal screening, it will already suggest a lot uh, about the plot and uh, they then they can make a decision if they want to buy or uh, the property or how to remediate it. Because if soil is contaminated, there are so many ways how to remediate it as well. So it's not a um, deal breaker. Yeah, I was I was really curious about that because you you do hear 
okay, there's heavy metals in the soil or there could be heavy metals or, or oftentimes someone will just say toxins. Uh, and then you might, you know, from a scientific perspective have to say, okay, well, what are you going to define then as a toxin? Uh, and I know we're going to get into remediation later in the week, but as far as heavy metals go, what are the ones that you would really want to watch out for and in what amounts in the soil? Yeah, that's a great question. Definitely lead is probably number one priority uh, metal that we want to test for. There are so many labs that can do screening with at a very low cost. So, uh, or maybe there are some even um, university labs, they provide free service uh, to people so they can send multiple samples and um, get tested for lead. But you can also test for more for arsenic, cadmium, mercury. Um, then you can go to some copper and zinc, although they're nutrients, but the, if they are too toxic, they're too many of too much of them in the environment, they can cause some plant toxicity, maybe less of a human problem, but more for your plants. Uh, but definitely would love to see arsenic, cadmium, mercury, um, and um, lead uh, in your test. Let's say someone does find a, a, a over the normal amount or potentially a harmful amount. I know we've talked about remediation, but is there is there a level at which you might, let's say, not buy the property? Good. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So there are different uh, thresholds or guidelines that are provided by EPA or maybe state agencies that you need to follow. And for example, for lead, if we take that one into account, uh, EPA guideline for children playing in a bare playground, uh, so in a bare soil in a playground would 400 parts per million or milligram per kilogram, practically mm -hmm. similar units. Uh, if it's industrial soil, then uh, the guideline goes up to 1200. However, mm. empirical observations from researchers done uh, in multiple cities around the US found that uh, it should be less than or about like 40, 50 parts per million uh, for children. The, at this level, um, Blood lead. Well, they come when they do research. Basically, what they do is they try to find the agreement uh, or like association between blood lead level in children and soil lead. And that level of 40, 50 parts per million, it's uh, looks like it's a safer. There is no safe threshold exactly for children, but if it's below 45 parts per million, uh, it's uh, less likely for children to get exposed and accumulate this lead in their blood. So there are thresholds, but also uh, some empirical research done by uh, scientists mm -hmm. that should follow. What is also interesting to know that uh, natural soil contain always different uh, levels of metals because it comes from rocks and rocks naturally mm -hmm. have many different metals in them. So you really need to know where you are and what kind of bedrock is around, what kind of natural soil is around, because maybe uh, uh, it's not human um, activity maybe just rocks, yeah, yeah. yeah and then it's not something you need to worry about so uh, do the testing compared to the guideline that provided by the state or by epa um, and then uh, see what is the natural level and try to get to a closer as to natural level as possible and also sure. it's important to know what is um, around um, your property it's not even uh, you don't even have to test sometimes. You just need to know what is the history of your uh, property. Uh, was it a vacant lot? Was it agriculture field? Is there any plant around? Was it a factory? How far it is? So those um, things are important to consider, like land management practices, uh, history of the plot, and what uh, is uh, in the close vicinity. So here's an interesting question then for you, because I know my home itself is roughly 100 years old as far as construction. And I know that prior to that, in my area, it was an olive orchard. So would I assume that in general, it was orchard or agricultural land and, and it might be okay without testing? Or perhaps back then, some sort of treatment on the olive trees could have, could have added heavy metals to the soil? That's a great question. I did research in New York and New Jersey, and we found there was um, apple orchards uh, that were... Um, exposed or the or apples were actually <laughs> sprayed on with the lead arsenate pesticides. So this orchards experienced a lot of pesticides over a few decades in the early 20th century 
to kill gypsy moth. It was common for peach trees and potato fields as well. So just because it was at the orchard or agriculture field before, it doesn't mean they may not have any contaminants in them. It is very possible its legacy contamination is still there. So it would be good to dig in a little bit of history and see what the was done to those olive trees if they were sprayed with pesticides because they uh, depending what kind of pesticide it may still persist today how should i think about this and if i'm maybe testing for i don't know heavy metals sure so when you have a garden you want or backyard of your property you want to consider different zones uh, if it's a uh, your ornamental garden, you take one sample, representative sample from that ornamental garden. If you have a vegetable garden, you take another sample. If you have a lawn, you take another representative sample. So each management um, zone or zone with different management uh, should have its own representative sample. And what do I mean by representative sample? You basically take uh, samples, uh, multiple samples, depending how big your plot is, but maybe up to 10 samples, random spots, and then put it um, into a bucket, mix it in, and then this is where you collect one representative sample. You take one cup or half a cup and put it in a plastic bag uh, or a special container and send it to the lab. Uh, so representative samples, it's really a mix of multiple samples from uh, one particular area of interest. Your tree uh, peat will ha might have different results from your vegetable garden and your lawn will have different results as well. Also, it's important to consider the depths of sampling. So if you want to test uh, just for uh, exposure uh, to children for, against heavy metals, uh, you should collect the uh, top couple inches because that's where most of metals will be and you want to make sure when kids are playing when they touch the soil maybe dig a little bit uh, so you, uh, you collect the top couple inches and that's what you measure for he heavy metals if you're looking for growing vegetables in the, like in general go to six eight inches deep so the layer of the top soil if you want to do perennial crops, you can uh, go to depths of four to six inches. If it's a woody perennial crops, you can do zero to six inches uh, and also second layer six to 12 inches, like a deeper horizon. For cro cover crops, it's a zero to four inches depth. And uh, for uh, lawns, it would be, of course, m much more shallow compared to your vegetable gardens. So think of the root zone of your plants, how far roots are, and this is the depths you uh, want to collect. Uh, sometimes you may, if it's deep enough, you may even consider to take top layer and the uh, subsoil, like lower layer, um, and um, get those two uh, different samples. But it, again, depends on how deep your roots are. Yeah, I was going to say, it seems like if, you kind of put your gardener's hat on and just think about what the plant is you're trying to grow in that particular area that you want to test. It, it's it's around that rhizosphere that you're probably going to want to be testing, right? Exactly. Right where the root zone is. Yeah. And it makes it makes a lot of sense as well for for kids that, yeah, they're, they're, they're not digging huge holes uh, and, and going super deep. So it makes total sense. So as far as as testing, let's say I have let's say I'm testing for heavy metals and maybe some you know nutrient qualities in a new garden bed area that I want to put in the ground. And I and I do have a kid and I want to make sure that there aren't heavy metals in that area. Once I have my samples, where should I be going to actually run the test? Is there a place that's very reputable, like one place, or is there sort of a network of places I could go to, to get something run? Oh yeah, definitely. You have so many options. You have commercial labs, which most likely going to be more expensive. And there are university labs. Um, there are um, like land grant universities, uh, Cornell University of Virginia Tech or uh, Purdue universities, many of those who offer uh, programs for like farmers, urban farmers these days too, when you uh, test multiple uh, tests. Um, really lots of tests, microbial tests, even uh, some tests for your roots, for aeration, so structure, you can go into really um, depths with those testing. As a beginner gardener, you may want to just take a few samples um, from your garden and do several tests 
to understand where you're starting off before you get overwhelmed with all the possibilities. So I would suggest to go to university, maybe it's your local university, or you can send it to any university in the country to who accepts soil samples. For example, in my lab, the Delta Urban Soils Laboratory at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette, we specialize on serving to uh, communities, uh, urban farmers, um, urban gardeners, uh, small um, and like maybe environmental firms or amendment companies. Nowadays, people want to know what also in the amendments and they want to screen before they have to um, certify their product. So we test for um, soil texture, for pH, for uh, salts in the soil, organic matter, for basic uh, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, um, and of course, heavy metals, that's um, our specialty, and provide the basic report back to you. So you really have lots of options that you can choose from. It depends what you uh, want to do and how much money uh, you want to spend, because each test would cost something. But universities typically charge the minimum um, compared to commercial labs. And I would yeah. my suggestion would go with universities. Yeah, I think in the past I had gone with a local nursery that had a connection to, I don't even believe it was a university in, in that particular case. And then I believe the last time I ran a soil test at my property, it went to the University of Massachusetts soil lab. Yes, that's um, very famous. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, I, I know that the Delta Urban Soils Lab is is one that you established at the yes. University of Louisiana. So I, I'm quite curious now if there are heavy metals in any appreciable amount in my soil. So I think I'll be I'll send, you, I'll send you some samples, Anna, and see what, see what happens. Here's a question I have that I'm sure everyone is 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 probably wondering is, is it really expensive to do all these tests or w what sort of budget should I be prepared to spend? Yeah, well, it depends on each university, each lab and the samples, um, number of samples they run. Um, I don't like, you can really look online on the, any lab, but they typically provide the prices. Um, I'll tell you for the price of like my lab, for example, to do um, six tests, it's a ch charge about $60. If you have um, multiple tests like we have amendment companies who send the entire product line we reduce the price because it's a bulk but it's really a minimum price because we're not making profit of uh, lab tests it's uh, really to run operation of the lab and uh, it's also a great opportunity for student training because whoever takes my classes become uh, some of them become my interns and they learn how to do the soil testing um, in the lab. So uh, for universities, typically they spend for lab operations. That's why it's less mm. expensive than commercial um, labs. And so heavy metal test, I think uh, right now it's cost like $15 per sample. So it's mm. quite inexpensive. We provide several uh, metals and give you uh, interpretation, basic interpretation for your test. So you can order just heavy metal test, so you can pair it with pH, with soil texture. You have a choice how you want to um, what you want to test and um, mm -hmm. we will provide you with some interpretation if it means if it's low high numbers uh, if you need to do some basic remediation um, or if your soil texture is fine what you can grow in the soil texture got it yeah i mean honestly i, I always sort of say this sometimes when when talking about let's say the price of seeds where the difference between a two dollar pack and a five dollar pack for a plant that grows potentially hundreds of fruits or tons and tons of leaves. It's really minimal if you think about it. And, and I would say the same for soil tests. You know, if you're paying $15 and, and testing for heavy metals, uh, along with maybe some other qualities and the price goes up, even somewhere in the $100 range, if you're really committed to the garden, to me that that the soil is the bedrock of of the garden. I mean, that's where that's where the life is being generated. And so it makes a lot of sense to do that. Here are my two questions, Anna, and answer them in whichever way you see fit. Number one, what does the heavy part of heavy metals mean? Maybe a simple beginner question. And then number two, how do heavy metals get in soil if not from just nature and, and natural rock, etc.? Yeah, heavy metals, good question. Uh, nowadays, they actually want to change it uh, to uh, potentially toxic elements because uh, now we have more elements that are toxic and they're not necessarily metals. So there might be this term is changing in the near future. Uh, but heavy really is related more to density of elements on the periodic table. 
but when we Got talk it. about humans, uh, we should really uh, refer to toxic toxicity of this element rather than its heaviness on the periodic table. So that's why there is like shift to a new uh, terminology. So soon it might be potentially toxic element you hear more often. What would, what would be a toxic element that wouldn't qualify as an elemental metal, but is still harmful to, to show up in soil then? Yeah, metal, uh, arsenic, metalloid. It's not exactly mm. metal, but uh, it is uh, toxic. Super <laughs> was, yeah. Got it. And then the I guess the other question, and I think of things like, I don't know, maybe if your house used to be a gas station or something, that might be a good candidate for heavy metals. But I, I still am curious on just like the physical level. How do they permeate into the soil? Like, what's the common pathway for something to get contaminated? Yeah, that's a great question. So, uh, what we're talking right now in terms of lead and arsenic, called like chromium, nickel, most of these elements in the soil, they're legacy contaminants, meaning they were deposited here um, to the soil decades ago and it stays in the soil because they're not mobile. They're not moving in the soil quick enough to be washed away or go to the groundwater. So um, very common contaminant sources actually, as you said, gas, a gas station. So it may be gasoline that was um, b used before in 20th century. And the emissions from gasoline deposited in the soil, it accumulated over time and it's still there. It's a uh, lead paint is super important. It's uh, one of the major ways for um, lead still being um, added it to the soil because the old walls, old paint, they're chipping off and they add to the soil and then they can uh, re be distributed by wind or by runoff and go to like, further distances. So it's really important to know what kind of paint you have in your home and making sure you cover it or remove it uh, so it doesn't uh, cause a bigger problem. Um, other pr uh, sources, of course, it's a high traffic area with lots of metals that can come from cars. It's uh, waste uh, incinerators, landfills, and um, industrial discharges. Uh, maybe if the city is close to some kind of mining areas, you can have also wind deposits as well. So currently, there are, of course, some um, uh, air deposition from modern uh, anthropogenic sources. But really, when we talk about lead, it's uh, more of a legacy contamination that was here from before. So we talked about orchard. So some of the sources can be mm -hmm. pesticides as well. Uh, so lead yeah, arsenic yeah. pesticide was commonly used and it's still in the soil, although it hasn't been used for like 70 or 80 years. Wow. Wow. So is it safe to say that if, if even in my case, I guess, with with the olive orchards in the past history of this land, I'm not I still may not be safe. I have to at least consider that that they were sprayed in some way. So like human intervention, especially if it looks or feels industrial, seems to be a good clue that that I'm going to have to do some testing. Yes, it's better to be safe than sorry. And also, yeah. it's uh, if for heavy metals, it's more like a one-time investment. Heavy metals don't move much. So unless you change your landscape, you add new soil, you mix something in, it's not going. they're not going to change. So if you test them once, mm. uh, that's a, like it's enough. Then if you want to remediate it, you test it over time to see if remediation worked. But this, this mm -hmm. is not like pH, it's not uh, nutrients that change seasonally. So heavy metals, it's uh, really more more or less one time. It's, it's more static, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah, because I guess, I mean, if they're persisting for 70 years, it would follow that they're not fluctuating much over the course of those 70 years, they're still there. Exactly. So it makes total sense. Okay, I'm gonna get to the question that I really want to know, how do I remediate or fix soil that has these heavy metals or these toxic elements? And, and out of curiosity, just if we zoom up to maybe the industrial, the urban construction level, I'm, I'm assuming that sometimes this will happen in a construction project and they'll have to remediate that soil somehow. How do they do it in, in large scale? Maybe then we get to the smaller uh, backyard gardener. Yeah. So in a nutshell, there are ex situ and in situ remediation uh, mechanisms and ex situ are very expensive. And when they have to do it um, 
outside somewhere they take the soil it like in the construction site that you describe or maybe it's an old factory or maybe it's a brownfield they have to excavate the soil and bring it to facility and go through different treatments there are multiple ways how it can be done the soil washing they may go into different temperature regimes it depends what kind of contamination it is of course they may go to some sterilization there are so many varieties of um, choices these days, but it's super expensive. And that's why scientists um, came up with the ideas how to change uh, soil property and heavy metal contamination to make it less um, harmful to humans through in situ uh, application mm. of uh, soil amendments. So technically, we don't okay. have to go and uh, take this, excavate the soil and bring it somewhere and use other resources like electricity and water to clean it, but rather use some uh, organic waste or maybe inorganic uh, fertilizers like phosphorus uh, to chemically change metals in the soil where they are to make them less harmful to people. Just to define terms for those who don't know, ex situ would be outside of the situation or, or outside of the environment you're trying to. So in those cases, why it's so expensive is because you're quite literally hauling the soil away to treat it with a variety of those methods that you described exactly. and then bringing it back and replacing it. And that would be, of course, crazy expensive because it's so heavy and uh, just the, the process must be crazy. OK, so we, we see how we do it, perhaps at a, at a larger scale, I would imagine Ex, ex situ or outside would be not feasible for the home gardener. So we're talking about in situ stuff or on property. What could I do? Let's say if I have, I don't know, a hundred square foot area in my backyard that that is contaminated, but I still want to garden in it. What's my best option? So definitely the best option would do compost or mulch, some sort of organic amendment. There are other options like using fertilizers with uh, enriching phosphorus that scientists also found to be um, effective in uh, remediating lead, but it may be a little bit too complicated for an average gardener to figure out the amounts they need to add to make it uh, efficient. So the easiest way is to take a compost, maybe it's from your local facility that give you compost for free maybe you buy it uh, and then you either uh, mix it in with your topsoil or maybe you cover it on top to create a blanket and over time you will build up new layers by just bringing new uh, soil or new um, compost uh, mm -hmm. there are other ways how you can do it uh, if you grow raised bed and you know soil is contaminated you don't want to plant anything in that soil, you uh, put a landscape fabric underneath, you build a raised bed uh, tall enough for your vegetables, wherever you grow, to grow in that raised bed because like tomatoes, they have a long uh, root system. So you would need something that's taller versus like leafy greens. So consider the height of your um, raised bed um, based on what you want to grow in it. And then you bring a new soil with a clean compost into your raised bed. So that would be an option too. But if you just want to have planting in your backyard with no raised beds, uh, adding compost and mulch in surrounding areas where you walk, like your path walk, uh, you don't garden, it would be a great idea. Not only organic matter creates the barrier, but also it... Uh, when it breaks down, it releases nutrients to the soil, it feeds microorganisms, it holds down more water, it uh, has more aeration, uh, it really creates this uh, favorable condition for microorganisms to grow, for vegetables to grow in, and it uh, combines uh, with the metals. So it forms organomineral complexes, and this oh, makes it wow. less harmful to people. That's why we want to um, have this effect in the soil with compost. Sure. So it sort of binds to the heavy metals and uh, transforms them into a compound that's just less harmful overall. Exactly. So this is, huh. I think it's important to introduce a new term for your listeners is bioavailability. Sure. And bioavailability means uh, in terms of like in our conversation is how much of the metal can be uh, uptaken by you know, organisms of humans, animals, or plants, and uh, it become toxic. So even if we measure high concentrations of metals in the soil, most likely labs are going to measure total concentrations. Uh, and it will take in, into account all possible chemical forms of lead or arsenic or chromium, but not 
all metals, not all total concentrations are harmful. It's really only the fraction that is um, bioavailable, meaning mm -hmm. it exists in a chemical form. It can easily uh, dissolve in the bloodstream in the human and t can be taken up by bones or by brain cells, but not uh, all metals um, in that form. So mm -hmm. when we add organic matter, we actually create uh, of non-bioavailable fractions. So metals are still there, but because they're bound to organic matter, they're not going to uh, be consumed or at least it's a sure. small amount by children. It's, it's almost human. as if they're, they're not there in, in the sense of can they be absorbed? Uh, right. So the compound yeah. is present, but 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 nothing's happening to the compound. So the question, I guess, a question I have as a follow up is: Let's say they're not bound. Let's ju just say that it's unremediated soil with some sort of heavy metal or toxic element in it, and you're growing edible crops in there. How much of those heavy metals can be taken up by a plant? I'm sure it's not as simple as that question. It's, it depends on you know the compound, or it depends on. I suppose, um, the, the element itself, but I am curious, you know, there's a lot of gardeners out there who say, or, or wonder like, I'm, oh, I'm growing in a metal bed. Is that, is that safe? I'm growing in a wooden bed. Is that safe? Or uh, all these compounds, they, they sort of wonder how does it actually get into the plant? And thus, if I eat it, get into me. That's an excellent question. So, uh, metals can come from different sources we talked about it but then how do they get to human body and there are three different pathways one through plants if you eat potentially contaminated plant it can get to human body uh, it's through ingestion or inhalation in very rare cases it can be dermal contact but it's mostly for occupation hazards and also leaching to groundwater and then we drink this groundwater so the main pathway for exposure is through ingestion uh, or through dust, uh, like house dust. Mm, so it's okay. really important for kids uh, when because they're more vulnerable, they're less, their immune system is not as strong as for adult. So they're more susceptible to contamination. So when they ingest their soil particles by playing in the ground, uh, it gets into their bloodstream. In terms of a plant contamination, uh, but the, it. Plants may or may not uptake toxins from the soil. It depends on what the plant is. Uh, so physiology of a plant is different. Uh, and also how tall they are. Like tomatoes, eggplants, um, maybe like squash, something grows further from the soil surface and the more of like a fruity vegetables. They have uh, strong physiological barriers inside of their roots and stems to prevent contamination going to the fruits or vegetables, but also they don't get splashes from surrounding areas. Mm. While leafy greens can uh, uh, get splashes from surrounding areas because they're so short and this dust uh, or um, splashes can contain particles of soil with lead, arsenic, cadmium. Okay. That's very hard to wash off. So you wash it. So it doesn't even. It. Yeah. Well, I thought that's, I didn't even think about the fact that it doesn't necessarily have to be taken in by the plant's tissue. It could just be on the plant via the groundwater or, or, or soil splashing. Yeah. So absolutely. It's important to wash your vegetables, but consider that it might not completely be washed off because it's such a strong adhere, ad, adhesion or adherence on the surface of a leaf, especially if it's like hairy mm. herbs that just capture it. Ah, uh, wow, yeah. And they hold like on. borage or, um, you know, s certain types of sage or things like that. It, it's yes. one drop of water. It's hard, it's hard to get it off. Okay, interesting. So if we were to leave someone with some, some encouragement, besides the raised bed issue, which I think is a great one, oftentimes, even if you just are growing on concrete, et cetera, raised beds make a lot of sense. But I loved them in the, at least early on because you just can put exactly what you want in there. You, you know you're not dealing with anything as long as your inputs are good. If someone is is going to do in ground, it sounds like the best thing to do is is add quality compost that you know, of course, the compost doesn't have any heavy metals. Yes, in it. that's a great point. Absolutely, yeah. Adding compost, adding um, um, mulch. There's some new amendments like biochar, biosolids. Uh, you can also play with those. Uh, anything that's uh, organic. Um, waste in, in the waste it's in a way it's a waste so anything that's a recycled organic matter it would uh, benefit but for sure you need to know uh, that the, those amendments that you're using they're not contaminated what are some things anna that that we can do 
just as good preventative measures? Yeah, that's a great question. I think you should definitely want to prevent yourself by not tracking uh, soil into the ho- into your home with the garden tools or your shoes or your clothes. Make sure you take this clothes off before you come in and it doesn't spread dust in the house. Uh, if you have children, make watch them. Make sure they don't eat if the soil is contaminated they don't should not eat it it's great for kids to be exposed to uh, in the environment and consume some soil if it's clean it's uh it's healthy for them but uh, make sure they wash their hands and do not uh, lick their fingers um, in the garden if the soil is contaminated Uh, what is also important um, in terms of um, management of the garden is that one we said we can have raised beds we can add organic uh, compost or mulches but uh, you can also uh, make your garden uh, more um, not only nutrient available uh, but also uh, less toxic when you we have your pH of the soil close to neutral slightly acidic pH like six to seven uh, is beneficial for availability of nutrients most of plants like growing uh, in this environment but what is also interesting that metals are the least available at this range so close to neutral pH uh, you will have less likely toxicity problem with metals. Most likely when the pH is uh, dropping, when it becomes more acidic, four, five, uh, in that case, the metals become more available and more harmful. So if you maintain the proper pH, you wash your hands, you have compost, um, you wash your produce, of course, uh, maybe raised beds, um, then you, and you test periodically for heavy metals, for other anal- uh, nutrients, pH, soil texture, you should be in good hands for healthy gardening. I have an interesting question. As you were saying that when soil pH drops too low, the heavy metals become more available. And we know in the edible garden, especially there's one crop that loves low, low acidity, and and that would be blueberries. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so is that potentially something to worry about, I suppose. If, if you're growing acid-loving crops, you're going to need to be a little bit more careful about the heavy metal. I would say so, yeah. So definitely make sure you test and you know what kind of soil metals you have because they may become har- more harmful, more available if pH drops. Okay. Yeah. So Got this it. is why it's important you choose uh, one of the other tips we can add to this healthy gardening is that choose uh, proper plants, right? The plant selection mm-hmm. is important. So choose fruits over roots if you plant in contaminated soil uh, because you can still plant without any amendment or raised beds like if you grow tomatoes. But if you want to grow carrots, potatoes or radishes, then you need to make sure your soil is suitable for that. Roots are a little bit more particular to worry about than, than the fruits, as you mentioned, that many of the plants that, that we're eating the fruits of have protective mechanisms to prevent those fruits from accumulating, right? Right. And roots have a very weak barrier, so they're more likely to uptake it. And especially carrots. You can peel the carrot from outside, but the core inside, that's an uptake mechanism. It actually takes contaminants uh, through the core. So washing and scrubbing and peeling the exterior really doesn't make a, a big difference in this particular case for this yeah. application. Yeah, huh. carrots. Interesting. Interesting. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's, it's been really interesting and informative, and, and I hope for everyone listening as well. And you have quite a few resources that people can engage with in your world, of course, you know, the Delta Urban Soils Laboratory, but also some online resources as well. Yeah, so anyone is welcome to check out our new website, uh, deltaurbansoulslab.com, where you can find uh, information on my students, uh, research students, undergraduate students, internship opportunities, uh, research project they're doing, but also how to submit soil samples to the lab. And we will get back to within a couple of business weeks with the test results. Uh, you can also learn more about soil science on my YouTube channel. If you just look up my name, Anna Peltseva, on YouTube, you will see uh, my uh, lectures, but also guest lectures from a world-renowned scientist who lectured uh, to my classes. So I use this as an opportunity to share with the world with their permission. So it's a really great resource to learn about the most recent um, advanced topics in soil science and environmental science from uh, those um, researchers. And uh, for those who are, want to follow me on Instagram, I have lots of different tips on the soil management, 
or in general about toxicity and environmental uh, issues on uh, soil or you can find me as a soil underscore expert and always feel free to dm me with any questions perfect well thank thank you so much for coming on and it's been really exciting and expect a package from from the garden sometime soon here this year i'm very curious i'll probably end up doing some sharing on who knows hopefully there's no problems but i guess i'll have to find out yeah yeah maybe there's some remediation we'll have to do here at the homestead as well so thanks so much for coming on and for everyone listening stay tuned good luck in the garden and keep on growing